Okay, without further ado, let's jump into module two. It's an IBM i system overview where we're going to talk about uh, the technology that's in the actual box, the physical machine, your IBM power system, and some of the things that IBM i, the operating system, will do for you. So let's start off with looking at the technology layer, shall we? Um, IBM i, the operating system, isn't defined by the hardware that it lives on. So it sits on top of a TIMI, a machine interface layer. Essentially, it's got two parts. It's object-oriented and it's computational. And another layer sits below this machine interface called the System Licensed Internal Code, the SLIC. It's, if you think about it, you have a layer of computing power that's controlling the machine and telling it what to do and how to store data and maybe how to mirror things. And then above that, you have another layer which says, right, this is how you store things, collect them into libraries. This is what tables and SQL files look like. And then you have a different layer for machine interface code that, that does things in there. So, for example, back in the, the 90s, the um, AS400 and i-series hardware was upgraded from a 48-bit processor, um, which in the world we called KISC or CISC, upgraded from a 48-bit to a 64-bit RISC power PC processor. And the technology layer allowed us to simply back up and restore the objects onto the new hardware with a 64-bit processor. And all the programs just ran as normal. But when they recompiled, they would simply recompile as a true 64-bit program. These multiple layers helped ease our way through this. Underneath the uh, operating system is 128-bit. And it's been this way since um, System 38 days. So IBM Systems 128-bit processors are already used. So they're ready for the day when the 64-bit operating system moves to a 128-bit operating system. When I've been talking about object-based design, what do I mean? So everything in IBM i is called an object. Programs, files, data areas, users, everything is called an object. So you'll hear your technology people talking about objects on the machine and jobs on the machine. Objects are things, bits of data or programs or files, everything's an object. And a job is a process that's running. So when you submit a report to be printed, that's called a job. When a user signs onto a terminal, that's called a job. So this granular level um, of object-based design lets us really easily see what the machine's up to, what it's storing, and what it's doing. The hardware itself just sits there, and because of this multiple layer, it's just focused on getting on with what the machine is doing. It's optimized for information retrieval and storage, and obviously the new power systems have really good computational performance ratings compared to the old AS400 systems. But the biggest reason for um, IBMI's success is the operating system, the software itself. It's um, often people talk about IBMI success is that it runs all the way back to the old machines and it comes everything out of the box. Security, communications, backup, recovery, database, web servers, all of this stuff is fully integrated into IBM i. So using the, sim the, the system is simple, right? You sign on using a terminal emulator. You'll all have seen these. They're commonly called green screens. Or you connect using a web UI through a browser. Not so many companies do it this way. But you don't need to install any software on your machine. You can, you can run your browser, go to your machine, and it looks just like a green screen running inside the browser. Um, using IBM i itself on the computer is command line based, uh, very simple to use, and it has a very clear naming structure. Every process, as I mentioned earlier, that runs within IBM i is called a job. Look, that's a picture of Odd Job from one of the 007 movies. <laughs> Such an idiot. But so when you sign on and off, you're starting and stopping a job. Jobs are not odd. Don't be Odd Job. I make myself laugh. Now, jobs come in two flavors, two main flavors on our machine. Um, they're always identified by uh, the job name, the user name that's running the job, and a unique number for each job. So whenever you talk to IT, if you're reporting a problem, if you give them your job name, your user, and your job number, that identifies explicitly what you're talking about. Right. On the machine, we have interactive jobs and batch jobs. 
Very simply put, when you sign on and you're doing something and it requires human input into a screen, that's an interactive job. Everything else that's running in the background, background processes, system jobs, communication jobs, web servers, they're all called batch jobs. So interactive is normally human active input. Interactive jobs will call programs in a sequential order. Think about an order entry process where you enter the customer and then go and create an order header, then manually input the order lines. Batch jobs simply mean things that run in the background. They're broadly split into system jobs, communication jobs, and queued background jobs. Uh, batch jobs start automatically, or they can be scheduled to run at certain times, or they can be triggered by certain actions. They can all be queued up. Batch jobs can, um, they're all queued up in this thing called a job queue. And job queues are defined within a subsystem, which has a portion of the system memory. And those job queues can be held or released at will or as you uh, design them. Um, when these jobs are running on the system, all the different jobs have different runtime priorities. Think of this as the lower the run priority, the more important it is at getting a slice of processing memory. There are many other components that define how fast, how long, and how intensive each job's runtime parameters are, but we'll look at those in a later presentation. For right now, you just know that everything that's running is a job, and its priority means how fast or the bigger size of a chunk that it gets of memory. So something running with um, a priority of 10 will get much more of the memory than something that's running as a priority of 99. That'll be the last thing to get a slice of memory. Every subsystem that's running, how we break things up that are executing, are fed by multiple job queues. But any given job queue can only belong to one subsystem. Jobs stack up in these queues and they have a priority on the job queue. Uh, the lower the priority number, the quicker they'll be processed. But jobs with equal priority are all just processed in a first come, first served order. FIFO, first in, first out. Communication jobs are started by a remote system I system. Think of something like a web service making a call to your machine to retrieve order details. The web server might be configured to submit a quick job that will gather that information and return it to the caller. And again, the key to all of these processes is the job ID, the job name, the user, and the number. System jobs are always running. This is one of the great things about IBM I. It spawns and handles its own machine requirements. But running various system jobs um, are always running at different times of the day and doing their own things. Okay. So jobs are unique. Every job on the system has a unique name, made of a name of a job name, the user, and the job number. And any reports that a job creates are called spool files. Don't be confused with a database file. A spool file is a simple text-based report, kind of like a PDF where the programs print. We can print them in PDF layout, but lots of the older AS400 and um, i-series reports look just like plain text. You've seen them. Um, everything that's printed like that, they can be printed in the plain text way, which is the old fast way of doing it. Or, of course, we can convert them into a PDF, a Word document, an Excel spreadsheet. And then more and more commonly now, reports aren't, are no longer printed. They're converted into one of these job, uh, one of these print share formats, and then they're emailed. Um, you can, of course, view your spool files when you generate a report by going into IBM I Access for Windows. That's your green screen, or as on the screen there you can see, I prefer black on white rather than green on black. It's just better on my eyeballs. Um, I can display screens, or you can use... ACS, which is the client solution that when you click on a spool file and you click on it, you see it straight in the browser. So if you prefer more of a modern Windowsy UI to look at your reports, you can use ACS to do it rather than the terminal mode. Now, how do we keep track of these jobs that are running? Every job has various logging information. So it has this thing called a, an event log and we call it a job log. We're looking at it on the screen there where it records everything that happens in that job for the duration of its run. And the amount or detail of this logging is controlled by various job and system settings. So we can set it up so that it records virtually nothing apart from this thing started and this thing ended, to really recording every single line of code that it processed. And we can change those details on the fly where we're doing it. 
all of the jobs that are running on the machine have different slices of memory based on their runtime priority and all this kind of thing. And of course, we have some really nice tools in IBM I to let us look at what the jobs are doing and where they're running. If you see the screenshot I've got here, this shows a bunch of the heavy using jobs. We can see the run priority, the CPU utilization, the total synchronous input output, the asynchronous output, and the CPU utilization, and all these kind of details. Everything runs within subsystems, and they have a chunk of the memory and the runtime environments. So jobs are submitted to a particular subsystem to get a particular slice of memory and a runtime priority, and this is controlled by the job queue that they're submitted to. Subsystems can be started and stopped, and of course any job queues that are attached to those subsystems will just sit there snoozing, not doing anything if the subsystem is stopped. So for example, if I ended the web server subsystem, all the web services that are running would be ended. And suddenly all the users would be going, wow, we can't get anything on the machine. So logging gives us a lot of detail. It records what every job is doing. Um, it can send um, attention or wake up messages to the system operator queue. It can write to a central history log that we can query. Um, the machine even logs potential hardware failures. As I mentioned in the earlier module, if, if it notices there's some hardware that's going south, it can... Um, pump data off it, tell you it's broken, just say take it out, put a new one in and I'll start using it again. It also of course um, logs any security exploits. The bad guys out there in the internet land that are trying to hack their way onto the machine, it not only blocks it using its native IBM I firewall, but it will tell you exactly what it's up to. And so on. So that's a high level view of IBM I. Uh, in the next module let's dive just a little bit deeper. So next is Module 3, a deep dive.